Welcome everyone. Thank you all so much for joining the Libraries Community Reads team and, and the Health and Wellness Resource Center's Wellness Fest today for, um, for this food justice panel. We are so excited to have panelists from local farms, the Community Alliance for Global Justice, from our campus's Health and Wellness Resource Center, as well as a student moderator from Cascadia. Um, if you are a UWB or Cascadia student participating in Wellness Fest, you can enter a raffle to win an Amazon gift card for attending this event. Um, I think, yeah, Michael just put a link in the chat um, to that raffle form that you can use to, to enter the raffle for being here. To begin, the University of Washington Bothell and Cascadia College Campus Library acknowledges that we occupy land that has been inhabited by indigenous people since time immemorial. Specifically, this campus is located on Sammamish land from which settler colonists forcibly removed Coast Salish people to reservations in the mid 19th century. Historically, the Sammamish were closely related to the Duwamish, and today their descendants are members of the Suquamish, Snoqualmie, and Tulalip tribes. Campus library workers want to honor these native communities and their elders in particular. It is important to note that this acknowledgement is really just an opening and a small part of the ongoing work that needs to be done for us to repair harm and to be in good relation with this land and local tribal members. Thus, on the slide that is currently being displayed, we have provided some additional opportunities for learning and engagement. The Native Lands website maps the lived history of Indigenous peoples. You can enter an address on the site if you're not familiar with it, or click on the map to discover information about the tribes, languages, and treaties relevant to that place. You can learn more about the history of campus or enter the address of wherever you are now um, to learn more about your area. Sovereignty Farm is a new seat to table project that will provide opportunities for Indigenous elders, apprentices, artisans, and farmers to grow and serve traditional foods at the Chief Seattle Club Day Center and the cafe that will be available to the public in Chief Seattle Club's home building opening later this year. You can visit their website to learn more, including the opportunity to donate to the farm's overseeing organization, Native Works. And Real Rent Duwamish is an opportunity for those who live and work in the Seattle area to make rent payments to the Duwamish tribe who have not been justly compensated for their land and resources. Um, you can visit their website to set up monthly payments that go directly to the Duwamish Tribal Services. Um, the next three things on the slide are uh, library resources available from UW libraries and, and some availability from local public libraries as well. Promised Land is a documentary that follows the Duwamish and Chinook tribes as they seek recognition. An Indigenous People's History of the United States tells the history of the U.S. from the perspective of Indigenous people. Um, and I also understand that a portion of the new HBO series called Exterminate All the Brutes is based on this work. Um, and specifically because this is an academic environment, I wanted to highlight the book Research is Ceremony, which presents Indigenous research methods as a way to instill accountability and relationships into the research process. The documentary and books, like I said, are all available through UW Libraries. If you have any additional resources that you would like to share with this community today, um, you can go ahead and send me a chat message and I can share out with the rest of the attendees in a, in a little bit here. Um, I would like to tell you a little bit about the Community Reads program now. Um, for those of you who are new to Community Reads, the library has programming each quarter surrounding a common reading our intent is to facilitate space for critical dialogue around issues of equity, diversity, and social justice. Um, my name is Tammy Gerard, and I am the Access Services Manager in the library and a member of the Community Reads team. And I'm gonna let each Community Reads team member briefly introduce themselves now. So I will pass it to Cora. Hello everyone. My name is Cora Thomas and I'm a circulation lead at the campus library. Um, thank you for coming. We really um, are excited to have this, this event for, for you all. So thank you. And I can go next. I am Michael Mungin. Um, I'm multitasking. I'm sort of running the slides as well, but uh, I am a research and instruction librarian for Cascadia and for UW Bothell. And I am also happy to be here. I can go next. Uh, I'm Hannah. I use she, her pronouns. I am a materials processing technician at the library, and I'm also very excited to have you here. Uh, and I'll pass it to Sarah. 
Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah Ledley. I'm the Associate Dean and Director of the Library and uh, contributed very little to this event. Um, so kudos to the, the team members who just introduced themselves. Thank you, Sarah. Um, this year, Community Reads has focused on environmental justice issues all year. And during spring quarter, we have been focusing uh, specifically on food justice. So besides this panel event today, we have online programming with discussion space, activities, and an opportunity to contribute to our food justice zine. Um, that's all available in an online Canvas course, which is available to the UW and Cascadia community um, with a UW Net ID. And our reading this quarter is this amazing essay called Black Gold by Leah Penniman, who is the founder of Soul Fire Farm. In her essay, um, she addresses the history of Black communities, relationship to land and farming, the relationship between growing food and climate change, and the disproportionate impact of climate change on BIPOC communities. She also talks about how soil and relationship with soil can work to bring healing after a history of trauma and land dispossession um, experienced by BIPOC communities in this country. Um, the essay really is incredible, highly recommended. You can access it with your UW Net ID through the link on our website or within our Canvas course if you're affiliated with UW or Cascadia. Um, and at some point, we'll give you links to that website and Canvas course um, throughout the next hour and a half. Um, and you can still see the content for our previous quarters um, environmental justice themes in the Canvas course, although the discussion and the activity spaces have been closed down. But fall quarter, we looked at um, climate justice and specifically on rising waters, coral reef destruction, and indigenous activism. And then winter quarter, our, fo our focus was on climate refugees and climate migration. So I am going to now turn it over to Hannah to discuss the format of the rest of the event and community expectations um, before we begin our panel discussion. Thank you, Tammy. Uh, so yes, I'm just going to go over some expectations for the event, both expectations that you can have of us and for how it will look and expectations that we have of you as community members. So um, we have our, our, our community agreements up on the screen. Uh, due to time constraints, I'm not gonna go through all of these, but this is a set of agreements that we have as a preface for both in-person and online discussion events. And because most of the discussion in today's event will be taking place between our panelists, I'm not gonna go through these, they're not quite as applicable, but I do want you to keep them in mind as you engage in the Q&A at the end of the meeting and just in general. But I do wanna make a positionality statement, uh, which was written by Michael and adapted for today's event. Positionality refers to how one's worldview and lived experiences shape their understanding of an interaction with the topic. Our values, identities, experiences, biases, and previous knowledge influence how we interact with topics, texts, and even teachers, classmates, and colleagues. The Community Reads team wants to acknowledge that in discussing food justice and environmental justice, we are discussing matters that disproportionately target poor people and people of color, groups that have a long and documented history of having their values and experiences discounted and invalidated, including at educational institutions like this one. We seek to intentionally make space for such voices. All our panelists will be coming at the issue of food justice from different positionalities, and we know that all of you as audience members will be as well. So we encourage you to keep your own positionality in mind when reacting or responding to our panelists' discussions and when participating in Q&A. So among all this, the most important thing to remember is that we don't tolerate uh, hate speech or anything that targets marginalized communities. And unfortunately, we know that that sort of thing can and has happened at Zoom meetings before. So I just wanna go through some steps that we've taken to hopefully prevent anything like that from happening here. So I'm just going to do a quick outline of what the event will look like um, and throughout that outline the precautions that we've taken to hopefully make sure that everyone has a safe experience here. So once I finish this outline I'm going to do a brief introduction of our panelists and then I'm going to pass it over to our student moderator and to the panelists themselves for more in-depth introductions and also to get their discussion started. The panel discussion will be the bulk of the event today. It'll probably be about 45 minutes. And during this time, we do ask everyone but our panelists to keep audio and video muted. Um, we don't want to silence anyone, but if we do hear disturbing noise coming from your window, we will mute you. Uh, during this time, chat will also be closed uh, to all but our community reads team members. 
We ask that you hold your questions and reactions until the Q&A period, but if you do have any tech or access needs that arise during this time, please message those to Cora Thomas, who will be dealing with, so if there are any technical difficulties or, or things that we need to adapt to, please let her know. After the discussion, we will be opening the chat up for an audience Q&A. So we'll open it up so that everyone can communicate with one another. Uh, and at this time, we will be locking the meeting so no one else can enter. We're going to keep it open until then. Um, but once we open up chat, we're going to close it so that hopefully we don't get any uh, Zoom bombing. Uh, if you do leave the meeting before that time, you won't be able to enter, re-enter once we've, once we've locked the chat. So after we have our Q&A, we're going to have a brief reflection for the audience. This will just be a few minutes. It'll be one question that we'll ask you to think about. You can either put your answers in chat or you can just think about it on your own. Participation is totally voluntary. And if anything does happen, so again, we, keep you, we ask you to keep your positionality and keep our community agreements in mind when engaging with with our panelists but if anything does happen during the meeting that defies those agreements or that threatens the safety of any marginalized group uh that person will be removed from the meeting and we will be checking in with everyone after uh this meeting you should have clicked to accept recording when you entered this meeting is being recorded and a recording will be available probably in a few days we will give you more information on that at the end of the meeting so now that we've gotten some of those logistics out of the way, I'm just gonna do a brief introduction of each of our panelists and then I will pass it over to them. So with us today, we are very excited to have Ray Williams from the Black Farmers Collective, a group of urban food system activists dedicated to providing opportunities to improve the health of our communities through all aspects of the food system. We also have Emma Shore from Rising Sign Farm, a queer woman owned and operated vegetable farm in Carnation, Washington on the ancestral lands of the Coast Salish people, which is dedicated to food sovereignty and justice. We have Noelle Hutton from the Community Alliance for Global Justice, which is a, a grassroots group which works to strengthen the global food sovereignty movement through community education and mobilization. And we have Faye Farrells and Ree Robson from the Utah Bothell and Cascadia Health and Wellness Resource Center, or HARC. Uh, and Faye and Ree connect students to essential resources that allow them to reduce barriers and increase academic success. And finally, we're very excited to have a student moderator with us today. Juliana Folta is a junior majoring in sustainable practices at Cascadia College, who plans to pursue a career in sustainable and equitable food production. And with that, I am going to pass it off to Juliana and to the panelists to introduce themselves in a little more depth and to take away the discussion. Thank you all again so much for being here. Thank you, Hannah, for that great introduction. My name is Juliana Fulta. I go by she, her. And as Hannah said, I am a student at Cascadia College's Sustainable Practices Program. Um, I also hail from the Cascadia Sustainability Club, where we focus on education and hold conversations about what actions we can take to lead to more sustainable lives and how we can lead by example. We're also a hands-on club and are eager to participate in activities focused around bettering the local environment through acts of service. So if you're interested in engaging with that, if you're a Cascadia student, you'll learn more about how you can join us at the end of this panel, but also if you want to collaborate with the club, also reach out. We're very open and excited to work with anyone. With that being said, I'm going to pass it on to Ray to kind of introduce himself some more. Um, thank you, Juliana. Um, you know, I, I, I guess I want to first thank um, the organizers here for this and, and all the participants. Um, and I want to call out that um, thank you for the land acknowledgement and also uh, what, what needs to come with acknowledgements is how, how people can help, right? How you can actually do something. And so the, the fact that you shared that is really great. Um, Ray Williams, um, he is pronouns, uh, biracial, um uh <clears throat> and um you know i think because of your comment about positionality i'll 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 go just a bit into that that uh that biracialness here born and raised in seattle um you know um for the biracial folks out there i just had a conversation with folks and it was it, it was interesting how some folks ask you to choose right what you are and how how you identify and i think i pushed back from that but one of the things that I have done is I have chosen to serve a community. And I think because of our communities are separate, you, you sort of do have to do that. So I've chosen to serve the African-American community, the black community here um, you know, in Seattle by, by working with uh, the Black Farmers Collective 
to try to um, bring some more health to our community. So um, born and raised here, happy to be part of this, um, this panel, honored, thank you. Thank you, Ray, so happy to have you. Noel, could you go ahead and introduce yourself and your organization again? Hi hey everyone, my name is Noelle Hutton. I use she, her pronouns. Um, to add on to what Ray was just saying, thought I should call out today is Day of Awareness for Missing and Murdered Indigenous Persons. Um, and I'm not gonna go into that, but something to look into after um, our event today. Uh, I'm an organizer with Community Alliance for Global Justice, which Emma has been thoroughly involved in, yet we've never met before. She's kind of funny. Um, and our mission is to strengthen the global food sovereignty movement. And food sovereignty is a little bit different than food justice. They're all, they're all just terms, but um, though it has deeper origins, the term and definition we use today is coined by the um, global peasants movement by the name of Livia Campesina. And it means to the right of peoples to define their own food systems, which is culturally appropriate and uh, produced through ecologically sound and sustainable methods. And my organization came out of the 1999 Seattle WTO protests, which is the World Trade Organization. So we work on um, trade issues, especially related to agriculture. We also challenge um, big th philanthropy and the uh, central term to that is what we call philanthro capitalism. And it's very relevant to being based in Seattle because uh, the Gates Foundation is um, one of the biggest players in um, promoting industrial agriculture around the world under a guise of generosity. Um, so we do all kinds of things. Sometimes it's hard to explain, but that's the gist of it. Thank you, Noel. Great explanation. <laughs> Emma, how about you? Hi, I'm Emma. Um, I use she, her pronouns. I <clears throat> run a small farm in Carnation on Coast Salish land called Rising Sign Farm. Um, yeah, and to bring in some of that positionality, I think that's a great way to start. I'm queer, I'm white, I, I'm Jewish, and uh, I'm a transplant to the Seattle area, so I grew up um, on the East Coast. Um, and yeah, that, what else was there to say about me? I did uh, a lot of my politici politicization came through organizing with the Community Alliance for Global Justice and um, my organizing and politics have really rooted my farming practices and uh, why I farm today and grow food. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Excited to be here. Thank you all for organizing. Thank you, Emma. Re? Uh, yeah, hi, uh, my name's Re. Um, I use they, them, theirs pronouns or anything is all right. <laughs> Um, and I'm one of the Benefits Hub coaches for the UW Bothell Cascadia College campus. So um, kind of a complicated uh, situation with the Benefits Hubs. Uh, we do, there's Benefits Hubs at a few different colleges, mostly community colleges around the King County area. Um, that we're technically part of United Way, but then we also work under departments in each of the colleges that we're a part of. Um, so Faye and I are on the UW Bothell <laughs> Cascadia campus. Um, I guess since other people have said a little bit more about themselves, um, I am white. I'm from actually the Midwest, um, the Chicago area, and kind of moved out here partway through high school and went to college in the like um, Eastern Washington. So um, I kind of know the area, but uh, I'm a pretty recent college graduate. So still kind of getting used to being back in the Seattle area. And, uh, learning about all the different you know organizations and stuff that are out here. Thank you, Ree. And Faye? Hi everybody, my name is Faye. I am also a coach for the UW Bothell Cascadia campus. Um, just to go um, just a little more um, into about what we do, I know Ree mentioned a little bit about it, but we are 
essentially a part of the Bridge to Finish program. We're helping community colleges, college students graduate by helping them access resources like rent assistance and um, food and uh, public benefits and uh, just, yeah, just a little bit more about that. And then um, about myself, I grew up here in Washington State. I am a Filipino American and um, a Navy brat. So I lived all over different places. Um, uh, lived recently in Brooklyn for 10 years before I moved to, ended up moving back here to be back closer to family because of the pandemic and everything. Um, and yeah, not regretting any part of that. I love being close to my family and I'm really enjoying getting to know Washington State again. <laughs> Thank you, Faye. It is such an honor and a privilege to have all of you here today. I'm so excited to hold space for us to talk about food justice today. So with that being said, our next question is, tell us your food justice origin story. When do you first remember becoming consciously aware of a food justice issue? And how has that impacted your life and work? And what does food justice mean to you now? You can go ahead and popcorn whoever feels like they can speak, go ahead. I, I can start. Um, I think for me, food justice, when I think about understanding food justice, it really, I've been thinking about like, when did my political understanding of what food justice means come to be and kind of a transformation of being younger and like my family operating from what I would consider to be a charity model around food and food access into college and um, yeah, studying scholars like Vandana Shiva and Raj Patel and um, all these different people who are thinking about food in a political way. And then after that, um, through the Community Alliance for Global Justice, a lot of becoming more radicalized around those politics and kind of moving out of a food justice realm and into a food sovereignty realm and thinking about um, what does it mean to have democracy in our food system and to be, uh, yeah, to have sovereignty in our food system. I can add on to that. Um, yeah, Community Alliance for Global Justice has been really formative and um, teaching me a lot over the past few years. I moved to Seattle in fall 2018 and started volunteering with CAGJ. So since then, um, I've learned a lot, but I think my food interest sparked when I was 11. I watched Meet Your Meat. Do any of you, I don't know if that was like a generational thing or it basically shows the horrors of factory farming. And I was like, I'm gonna be a vegetarian. And then <laughs> I became a vegan at 13. And now I don't like subscribe to any particular label of anything and I'm much more relaxed, but um, definitely since then, it's been like peeling back the layers of injustice in industrial food systems, which is in some ways endless and um, overwhelming. But uh, yeah, I guess as Emma was talking about food sovereignty, it's really um, a lens and a lot more about self-determination and understanding where power lies in the food system. And uh, yeah, it's it's a beautiful world to get involved in and lots of beautiful people involved in food work, I have to say. Yeah, um, I, this is an interesting question. I had, you know, I don't think I've really had been asked this originally. I, you know, I'm gonna say that um, for me, I've, I've been lucky, born and raised in Seattle. I was lucky enough, my folks wanted to do some traveling. And so um, um, in junior high, we they packed the boys into the car and drove to Mexico in 1968 after the Olympics. And so for me, I think this, this the first of many trips and traveling that I've, that I've done, um, you know, you, you, you move out of this sort of, um, middle class um, integrated neighborhood and you go through the US and then into Mexico and you start to see hungry people. And so 
for me, that was probably the, the start of this idea that there was injustice out there, right? You see folks that are obviously, and at that time, um, you know, the uh, income inequality of Mexico was maybe what it's like now here, right? And there were a lot of poor people. And so I think we really, really got a, a, a chance to, to meet some folks and understand that folks, that, that folks really could be hungry, at, you know, at that age. I think I, I um, in terms of getting into the work now, I'm going to skip forward a, a long way, but I was, I was teaching um, biology and nutrition at the Art Institute and, and doing a little bit of urban farming, um, carrying on the fact that I like to garden everywhere. And it, it came really, um, be, um, I became aware of the connection between nutrition and health. And so that's when I, I started to, to realize, uh, how can I help my community here um, so many years later? And part of it was um, to try to get more people to do uh, grow a little bit of their own food. I think there's so much health-wise um, in growing your own food, and this and in I think this is an environmental question because humans are part of the environment, and so how you interact with your, your daily life is 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 often an environmental question. And so how how to try to get folks to do a little more of that. And that's when, you know, started talking to folks about forming an organization that might support people, especially black people to get on, onto the land of Black Farmers Collective. And we, we have, um, uh, we are now farming Yes Farm, which is a, a one and a half acre farm uh, on the freeway right away in central Seattle. Um, and that's given an opportunity for, um, you know, it's open to everybody and we want to be inclusive, but it's, it's uh, it's to develop black and indigenous leadership. So we're trying to have young black leadership there. And then the, the um, um, you know another project that we have that I think is is it definitely is connected to this this healing, but also food justice is that we're leasing some land in Redmond. So now we have a four acre farm, and we've been able to hire a young um, a young man to be the farm manager and to to go from the academics to the actual farming. And so um, we've gotten a lot of support. So a lot of our products are going to, and last year went to, uh, to uh, mutual aid efforts, right, to try to feed people. Um, and this year more, but we're also trying to push into that economic development piece, right, that you can't, um, so many times you uh, gardeners, you, you know, you grow food, oh, who do you donate it to? Well, how do we, how do we pay, how do we pay the farmers? I think Emma's probably struggling with that one right now. So I think that's that's a piece of my journey from, from youth all the way through to where we're really trying to sort of make a difference on the ground right now, so. We could talk about struggling to pay farmers all day, Ray. <laughs> okay, so I guess I'll go. Um, my origin, like, uh, basically throughout elementary school, I was uh, like a reduced lunch kid. I get free breakfast in the morning and I, um, paid 40 cents for my lunch and everything. And, um, I always knew like going to the grocery store with my mom, I wasn't able to pick out whatever I wanted. I couldn't get the same snacks as other kids. So I guess that's like how I kind of grown up and like to this day, I'm still pretty I'm always checking prices on things and whatnot and trying to get the best deal. But, um, and like with that being said, growing up, like I also didn't have an understanding of nutrition. I played sports and whatnot, but my mom and dad didn't really cook us vegetables. I didn't really eat vegetables growing up as a kid. I was eating a lot of um, like Filipino food, which was great, very greasy and fried and a lot of rice and whatnot, but um as far as like getting everything that I needed nutritiously, like I wasn't, that wasn't um, a thing that we got. And also just because my mom was always usually at home while my dad was away, we were eating a lot of fast food or like boxed food, I guess like you could say, like what do you call TV dinners? <laughs> um, and so it wasn't until I reached college, I really started understanding the importance of food. I started feeling really sick and whatnot. And um, it was really affecting my energy. And so I started um, uh, getting into 
uh, nutrition and health and fitness and whatnot. And that is like how it all began. And then um, now with the work that I do with the Benefits Hub, helping others and understanding that um, they don't have access to the same things that other people might have and understanding the importance of eating healthy and whatnot to, to function and to like feel good every day and whatnot. So um, yeah, that's basically my story <laughs> in a nutshell. Oh yeah, I'm gonna let Faye go. That definitely reminds me a lot of um, what I remember seeing when I was growing up, all those, the differences between who gets what school lunches and that kind of thing. And that's kind of when I was thinking about what the Benefits Hub does and how a lot of the work we do is really centered on like food insecurity for college students and how do we at least get them like some food so that you know, you're not struggling through all your classes because you haven't eat, eaten today. And I guess I was thinking about really how I became aware of all, all that stuff that was going on while I was in college, you know, just a few <laughs> very recently, uh, these past couple of years, um, and kind of seeing this divide between the people at my college who, you know, had this financial support to just like you know, go out whenever they wanted and they'd go to like all the nice restaurants in town, like all the sushi places or whatever, and like wouldn't even ever go to like the dining halls versus the students who are stuck on this meal plan that, you know, doesn't even like totally cover two meals a day that, you know, you're supposed to be trying to like use to support yourself while, you know, not actually being able to eat more than like dinner and maybe a lunch a day. Um, and there was this whole, well, I know this was this really difficult time, like the start of my junior year, where they were like transferring how they did the meal plan. So it used to be like an all you can eat kind of situation. You go in and you just sign in once and you can take whatever you want. And then they transferred it to a more of like, you know, pay as you go. You have to pay for each thing that you're taking um, with, with your, you know, meal plan money. And it became this really tough situation where like halfway through the year, the school was having to like give people more money because they hadn't actually like planned for anyone, you know, hadn't worked out. How much do people actually need to not start starving halfway through the school year? Um, and just thinking like how poorly planned this was and how like how messy it was that, you know, we were supposed to be being supported by our college as, you know, 18 and 19 year olds trying to make it and here people still couldn't actually like afford to eat more than like one meal a day, um, even when they're on the meal plan. And yeah, that's just something we've, we've kept working on uh, with the Benefits Hub, so. Um, I know we had a couple slides that had some data about it, but I also don't want to like derail the whole conversation. Uh, if people have other comments. That just makes me think of how, I don't know what word to use, disgusting it is that one of the major reasons we want to reopen schools is because kids can't eat because the school is who feeds them. It's like there's something something twisted going on there. It's super important work you're doing. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I'd like to add that. I mean, I guess we do need to thank the schools, right? Because the one part of the schools that kept going was the, the, the lunch program. And so folks have been employed throughout this. And I know we're going to talk a little bit about COVID later. And so I know folks in that work in those systems, and then I, I, I see different elementary schools that we worked with where um, not only the students, but the community, community members, you know, they don't ask for ID when, when folks want to come and try to get some food. And so that's, that's been a, um, you know, it's been encouraging that they've been able to step up um, across the state. But again, uh, to Noel's point, you know, this just says where we are in our society that if we have a little bit of a blip, I mean, it exposes um, folks not only to the rent pressure, right, and, and losing their apartments, but but actually not having an, enough money to buy food, right? Which, which is a is becoming a, even a global issue, right? And a lot of the issues around the world now are are stemming from the fact that that um, income inequality, 
and rising food prices really equals equals hunger. And um, so I think that's that's a piece that that we all, in our own way, are are trying to to fight against, right? Whether it's trying to produce more food at a at a reasonable price, whether it's trying to uh, have more local food to um, so it doesn't have to travel so far to um, you know, giving opportunities for folks to get into the system. I know that we're, that's one of the things um, for the Black Farmers Collective is to say, yes, there's actually people of color that do farm and that they've been um, um, discouraged from doing that for the last um, certainly hundred years, uh, both officially um, and unofficially. And so how is it that we, we start to, to, to have that model? Um, where um, where the the farmers are as diverse as their customers. Thank you, everyone. In that case, we're going to move on to the next question. So, what strategies do you use on your farm or organization to support the causes of environmental justice and food justice? And I see Tammy has also dropped that question in the chat to refer to as well. Um, I, I, you know, I guess I'll go first on the, oh, look at this, awesome. Nope. <laughs> I guess I'll go first. You know, I'm uh, obviously in a position where I need to step back. And so, um, but I, I'll take the first one on this and then that'll be the last time I start. Um, and, you know, and we're, it's, so it's, that's interesting, certainly the food justice about trying to get more food produced as much as we can, right? We had an opportunity to grow food on this space. Um, we worked really hard to grow the food and we also worked hard to grow connections for what will we do with the food that we got here really wasn't about trying to sell it over at Yes Farm, uh, it was trying to get rid of it. I, I remember a, uh, 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 we make partnership with the organization and uh, some folks from uh, Uprooted and Rising said, hey, um, you know, we'd like to buy some food from some um, uh, people of color um, uh, food sources. And my response is, hey, well, hey, but how about, why don't you come out and actually help us grow some of it? And so they actually came out and volunteered. some of their volunteers are now part of our, the organization um, to plant some rows of food. And then they were able to come and harvest it and bring it to their food thing. So, and I think that's how we're, we're trying to look at food justice is, is trying to grow more food and then trying to make connections and getting it out to people that need it, right? And knowing that we can't be the dis distributors, but partnerships around, I think is, is a big way to do that. You know, I, I think environmentally, again, my, point of view is that humans are part of that. And so if we're able to help folks eat a little bit better, that helps the human environment. We're creating a space in the city and, and I would like to invite everyone to come down, um, uh, you know, um, check us out at Black Farmers Collective, um, our website. Um, we have open volunteer times, Tuesdays and Saturdays. But to come out and be able to be in a space, especially if you're living, you know, in a, in a real urban space, connect a little bit with nature and that helps the human environment right your environment that is expanded into more of the nature you know get become part of the soil really feel the connection um you know it's good for your social emotional health because uh it's definitely stress relieving and you you know you're weeding or or planting you you you're sort of becoming something part of of, of something you get outside of your head in order to be able to do that um so that's a great thing i think you know, environmentally, it's, it's, there are a lot of environmental, uh, good environmental impacts um, to a sustainable or regenerative type farming, right, where you're, you're, you're building that environment and things. Um, you know, when you look at a tiny little small space of land, I, you know, I don't know how much carbon we're going to be able to sequester there in terms of that, but I, but I do know that, you um, if, if we be, can become a model for other folks to be able to go out there and, and, and try that small farming and and uh, certainly not add pollutants and, and really try to, to make a better 
sort of large environment. Um, you know, um, you know, just excited to be part of that. Yeah. I'll jump in there next. Um, so United Way of King County, we basically, we focus on eliminating poverty and inequality more generally rather than like env environmental things. But um, we do have um, our campus pantry. So for anyone out there um, who needs food, we have the Husky Pantry. We have curbside pickup. Uh, we take RSVPs and then Cascadia's campus also has the Kodiak Cave, um, all donation based. Um, and whatnot, we are there once a week and we're trying to um, expand those hours or at least find a way to partner with programs like DoorDash who can deliver to students who aren't able to come to campus. Um, basically, the way that we're helping uh, students is by finding them immediate resources and food solutions um, in the community, whether it's our pantry or local pantries. Uh, we also have Hope Link Mobile Market that comes every first and fourth Thursday to campus. And that's an opportunity for students to get more uh, fresh produce rather than like canned beans or, you know, just, or like perish, uh, non-perishable foods. Um, Hope Link Mobile Market has more fresh uh, groceries that, um, and then also connecting students to public benefits like SNAP, which is a uh, basic food, um, also known as um, EBT, AKA ones known as food stamps um, and uh, WIC. Um, and uh, just making students aware of how they can apply for these things, finding out if they're eligible, what the qualifications are and with the current state that we're in, uh, like a lot of the eligibility requirements have changed over time. So it's like best to just check in with us again. So this is just a quick plug also to <laughs> schedule an appointment with us if you're curious about learning more about these uh, benefits. Um, uh, if you weren't um, qualifying before, you might be qualifying now. And so we can look into those, um, those things with you. Um, and let me think, is that, did I cover everything, Marie? <laughs> I, think, I think I did. Um, yeah, just the, all those immediate things and then getting to know people in the community, like all the cool folks here who can direct us to other resources as well. Totally. Also, I will say that even though um, we don't have like, we don't really uh, focus on environmental justice, we did take part as the heart took part in a sustainability fest last week or a week ago or two weeks ago. And we kind of just tied in ways to go green and be more sustainable and how that can save you money and, the, and how eating fresher means that overall in the long run um, can put more money into your pocket. <laughs> um, yeah, I can talk a little bit about what we do on the farm. Um, one of the reasons I love food and growing food is that it can really connect these things of environment, environmental justice and food justice and food sovereignty because they're like all rooted right in the land and the way we've historically treated land and people and continue to do today. So um, Rising Sign, in terms of environment practices, uh, most all of our farming practices are uh, trying to do better by the land than what uh, traditional tillage systems have done. So if you read Aaliyah Peniman's essay, she talks a lot about the tillage agriculture where you're just beating up the soil by spinning it with a tractor implement. And that every time you do that, you're releasing carbon into the atmosphere that has been sequestered in the soil, um, which is one of the like incredible powers of our soils all around us is the power to sequester and hold carbon. Um, and to have these like mycorrhizal networks that are communicating with each other and with plants and trees and you know it's it's just incredible so we don't till on the farm which and we don't use any tractor implements so it's all hand tended and it basically means that everything that's sequestered into the soil is staying there um and we're small scale so like ray said how much impact are we going to have i don't know but i think if the more people, the more people who are growing food and the more people that are doing those kind of practices, um, the more we will have a big impact. And there are ways to 
do things without tillage on larger scales and growing grains and things like that, which we all, of course, love to eat and need to eat to survive. Um, so that's a really important part of our farming practices. And then we do other things like crop rotations and cover cropping and limiting our use of plastics. And we don't spray any pesticides and all those things um, we're trying to contribute to a, to a healthier environment, which as farmers, we are already seeing firsthand the impacts of global warming and climate change. And um, yeah, it's, it's tough. And um, go into that as kind of a separate issue. And then as far as what we're doing to advocate for food justice and food sovereignty, I think um, our, our, a lot of all of our economic practices are based around solidarity economics. So we have a sliding scale CSA where it's um, very practical in some ways of like people who can pay more can help subsidize people who can pay less or can't pay at all. We accept EBT for that CSA. Um, it's also kind of like a political education project to talk to folks who can't afford CSAs, which if some of you might know, have a kind of a really big upfront cost. And generally, uh, I think in the last few decades, at least have been seen as like something that will wealthy folks only can afford, um, which is true in many ways. So doing some of that education around like, if you can afford this, what can you afford to give? Um, we also work with Uprooted and Rising and other mutual aid organizations to donate produce that we have in surplus. Um, we pay real rent, which is equal to our land lease every year because um, we sell in Seattle. So we're also occupying Duwamish land. Um, yeah, but I think uh, figuring out how to do all of this and implement it under a capitalist system where it's like, farm you know farming is such a low margin business and I feel weird thinking about myself as a business owner but that's the reality like I do own a business and I am trying to make a living and then also ultimately trying to provide right now I don't have any employees but that was my dream to be able to provide a living for other folks who might not normally have access to creating those kinds of skills or having safe rural spaces to be in um yeah, but how do we do that under capitalism and also provide food to folks who need it? And so I think in the long run, I think about like, what would it mean to decommodify our food system? What would it mean to have universal basic income for farmers and farm workers? And how do we cooperatize to make um, farm work more sustainable for individuals, for the community, and then also to, to make it affordable for people or free for people who need to eat because yeah that's that's kind of where my my brain dreaming goes at CAGJ we view ourselves as not an individual organization so much as part of a larger global movement um, and part of that we see um, that social change comes from building relationships. And so that's relationships among fellow organizers and peers and groups within our circles, but it's also building relationships along the food chain. And something I don't think I mentioned earlier is that in addition to our trade issues and um, Gates Foundation program, um, we work with a lot of Washington-based organizations at different levels of the food chain. Uh, some of those are uh, Farm Worker Union, uh, Familias Unidas por la Justicia, and um, Community to Community Development. If you've ever heard of them, they're super cool. Um, also, United Food and Commercial Workers 21, UFCW 21, who works with uh, grocery workers and um, other, uh, labor union sort of work. Um, we also partner with Got Green, who does a lot of like food security work in uh, primarily South Seattle. Um, and yeah, that's just an example of the ways in which we show that there's all this work being done all along the food chain and um, bringing people together um, in order to make change collectively is a primary 
feels weird to call it a strategy, but it's something that we do that we see as a super central to making change happen at a systemic level. Um, we also provide research support for um, lesser so in Washington state, but we have a lot of partnerships on the African continent with uh, Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa, and we provide um, research support such as into Gates Foundation, the way that they are infiltrating many different areas. Um, maybe I'll send some of our reports as resources for after this. Yes, thank you everybody hearing about regenerative agriculture and working with the soil and working with the community and student ex accessibility is so powerful. Um, and as we enter the last nine minutes of our panel discussion here, um, I want to ask you one last question. So what are some impactful steps everyone here could take towards food justice? can jump in real quick. And I think there are so many things we all can do. Um, it's kind of hard to, to start, but I think understanding the true cost of food is a good place to start on a personal level. Like when you go to the store and you buy a box of cereal, why does it cost the how much it does when you buy hamburger at a restaurant? Why does it cost that much? And a lot of it has to do with the way our government is subsidizing grain and supporting um, commodity crops and also supporting the meat industry through those subsidies. Um, and then things like vegetables are considered specialty crops and don't get any subsidies <laughs> from the government. So when you go to the farmer's market and your carrots cost $4 instead of $2, that's because those somewhere in the in that chain, somebody is not getting paid or somebody is getting paid. And yeah, understanding all those the, those many layers is a good place to start. Um, of course, that doesn't solve the problem of like, we still probably can't afford $4 of carrots or many people can't afford $4 carrots because that's a lot of money for carrots. Um, yeah, so I think that's a good place to start. And then in the kind of more like dream space advocacy world, I think learning about that and then thinking about like, what would the world look like when that's not the case. So I mentioned earlier, what would it mean to decommodify food? What would it mean if farmers and farm workers were automatically paid and we didn't have this kind of like uh, H2A programming where, or and um, undocumented workers who are severely underpaid and um, keeping our cost of food down because laborers aren't being paid. And then there are so many organizations to get involved with to advocate for change on a policy level to organize directly with farm workers on the ground. I think that's a really awesome way to get involved and think about what are the structural changes we need to see in the food system to to really make a difference. And then lastly, I would just say, if you what res whatever resource you have, whether it's money or time or energy or like certain skills you can give those resources to black and indigenous and POC run organizations like the Black Farmers Collective, um, you know, like Uprooted and Rising, Familias Unidas for la Justicia. There are so many organizations that can use those resources. And I think getting involved with those on a local level is a super great way to, to learn and to, to start making incremental changes in our food system. Um, thanks, Emma. That's a great list of things. Um, you know, I'm going to have to go back to the last question for two seconds because I wanted just to shout out to UW professor um, Melanie Malone, who does soil science, and we've been working together testing urban soils in gardens for urban pollutants, right? And here's an environmental issue that we ask people to grow food in their at their house, but we don't know what's going on in the soil. And so I think that's an important piece of, of environmental um, education is, is for folks to, to really understand where their soil is and not, not contribute to their problems by, by going there. I think that's, that's a big point. Um, you know, uh, to that point, I think if folks are growing, um, they should try to reach out 
um, to other folks. Um, Kane Conservation District does some soil testing. Um, you know, if you know folks um, that are hungry um, and you have access, then maybe maybe it's you that actually goes to the food bank and picks up the food and brings it to them, right? This is a little bit of a of, of a thing, you know. And I have a neighbor who, you know, we're we're um, working with the uh, Jama Food Circle down in in Columbia City, and and there's and there's also some food uh, giveaway spaces there. And so I bring some food to my neighbor who gives it to to their neighbor who has a lot of kids. Oh, so, um, um, just thinking about how thinking about your neighbors and where there are and what resources you have you know is a good way to actually act be active um in the food system. along with the great stuff um you know and I, i'm hoping noel will will we'll have some good ideas about you know how you can support um the uh ajc too uh you know moving forward because they're that that policy and thing that we we all really need to need to be at too yeah, I guess just kind of to echo echo Ray here. I know one of our big um, thoughts for what people could do is that like supporting your your neighbors, supporting your community. You know, do you have people in your community that can't go get groceries on their own, or um, is there something you can do to share with them? Like I I heard recently when we were looking around at some of the food resources in the like um, community, the local areas. There's some people who are working on making more like what are called like the little free food pantries where it's like you know someone's corner of their garage that they've made into like a little food pantry that anyone in the you know in their neighborhood can go to and thinking about what kinds of things you can do like that um and then also i wanted to echo something like emma kind of said something about like there are a lot of people out there who can't afford like you know those Four dollar carrots or whatever and I just wanted to say you know that's something that we should you know really like think about those ways that you can kind of reduce those like stigmas about being you know someone who is food insecure or someone who like is on like public benefits to help them um, with their um, being able to get groceries and oh, there's all these stereotypes of like oh well you know you're lazy or that kind of stuff that you know, we can really work on spreading awareness and saying, no, it's not, you know, someone's fault that they're dealing with food insecurity and we should support them instead of, you know, um, hurting them more. <laughs> and then I guess kind of going towards those more like governmental policies you can think about is things like those public benefits programs like SNAP. Um, during COVID, there's been some changes that, you know, expanded the eligibility of these programs, but they're only supposed to be temporary. And it's like, we could really, uh, really, it would really be better if those policies weren't temporary and were even more expanded so we could get more people on it and kind of thinking about who you can talk to about, hey, these programs, you know, should be available to more people. It's kind of the thing. Thank you, Re. Something so valuable to think about. And thank you, Ray and Emma, for talking about ways that people can start getting involved and thinking more about their impact. Um, as it's now almost 3 p.m., we're going to enter the audience Q&A. And so I believe the chat is now open for people to start asking questions. Hold on one moment. In the meantime, actually, I'm going to throw up these beautiful slides that were provided that provided some uh, useful context on food insecurity. So I'm going to share my screen. Yeah, I guess just to explain, these were some of the slides that our um, Benefits Hub team put together kind of based on stats about both um, food insecurity for college students at like a national level is this first slide. And then we kind of looked into um, uh, our Utah Bothell and Utah Bothell Cascadia campus more specifically, and sort of those stats about different um, food insecurity at our like more specific communities. Um, so yeah, a lot of information here. Uh, if anyone has any questions about it, feel free to <laughs> ask us. I have a question. 
My name is Erin and I work in UW Bothell in the admissions department. I'm just curious if any of the panelists here today has any knowledge about food forest or permacultural um, techniques and if you're able to implement any of those on your current um, farm properties or lands. Um, I had a question like, um, so um, even though there are so many food, um, I mean like fruit things and stuff and the health there is like insecurity about food, I don't understand. Is it just like the SNAP benefits? Sorry, everyone. Can we just please interrupt and ask people to send questions into the chat instead of asking them aloud so that we can moderate them uh, and keep track of what's being asked and so that the panelists have a chance to answer? Thank you. Can I quickly speak to the last question that Juliana asked um, before questions come to chat? Um, yes, certainly. I would just want to give a plug to join organizations. Like I think we're often taught that making change is an individualistic process that you can make with your dollar, which of course, if you have money and can make intentional buying choices that pay workers a fair wage or that um, treat the soil better, treat animals better, that's all great stuff or donating to the food bank. Like those are just, um, those are one level when you partner with other people and see yourself as part of a social change ecosystem, which I highly recommend you look up because there's someone whose name I can't remember who made this really cool map just showing that finding your, your niche, um, what skills you can contribute, um, whether it be art or farming or teaching, um, many different levels of um, participation are needed if we're gonna, um, change these things. Also plug to see food issues not as separate from environmental issues like racial justice is food justice, environmental justice, gender justice, protecting indigenous treaty rights. All of these things are incredibly interconnected. So you can touch the world of food by getting involved in many different areas. And it just gets back to that statement on positionality like where do you have power and agency and where can you um, contribute in knowing that? That's all. Thank you, Noelle. Wonderful. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and ask the first question in the chat, which is, do the panelists view GMOs as contrary to the movement for food justice slash food sovereignty? Emma, do you want to start on this one? <laughs> Sure, I can start. Um, short answer is yes. Um, they are contrary to the movement for food justice and food sovereignty. To go a little bit more in depth, and I'd love to hear other folks' opinions on this, um, whether they're similar or different, but food justice, food access, food security is not about lack of food, which is the myth that big tech bio company, biotech companies have been pumping into us saying that we need GMOs to feed the world. There's enough food in the world. The issue is distribution. The issue is other inequities in the way our structures of society are set up. So we don't need GMO corn. We don't need GMO rice. We don't need GMO bananas to feed the world. Um, yeah, and then on the other side of that seed Sovereignty is a huge, huge issue in protecting our land, our biodiversity, our um, environment, and our ability to grow and produce food in a changing climate. So the more GMOs we have, the more we're patenting seeds, which are, in my opinion, a pub should be a public and free resource. Um, and those seeds are the things that are going to be regionally and locally adapted and that are going to get us through times that are already challenging and will continue to be more challenging as the climate continues to change. And so I think GMOs are not the answer. And I'd love to hear anyone else's thoughts on that as well. 
I'll add one quick thing. Um, it's even more so than like the genetic manipulation itself. A lot about genetic engineering is about the privatization of life and it's mm -hmm. about commodifying life, which gets back to Emma's comments um, about being able to own a seed, which I personally, that feels quite wrong. You know, yeah, I think as farmers, um, to be sustainable, you need to be able to save your seeds and grow crops for the next year. And the diversity of the seeds that we can have, that we do have now, can be shared and uh, adapted to, you know, environments that, that are really going to help us with, um, um, with changing climate. Uh, you know, I think, again, the idea that you have to buy your seeds every year and you have to buy the products that go with the seeds and the farmers are, you know, become um, beholden to the large corporations, just like all of us are, you know, have to pay for the food we have. So um, for me, the, it, me, the, the worst part of it is the economics and the, and the owning of the seed. And so um, we're, we, you know, we can't always buy uh, organic seed for different things that we have. Um, but we certainly stay away from, from um, you know, GMO crops. Yeah. I mean. Thank you. Wonderful. So our next question is, could one of the panelists address the lack of quality in our subsidized food programs, especially what's considered, quote unquote, healthy? Yeah, I mean, that was definitely something that Faye and I have been thinking about, especially trying to add more things to the campus food pantry, because I think Faye kind of mentioned a lot of our stuff has come from donations, and then even what hasn't come from donations, you know, we don't have a fridge in the campus food pantry. So, you know, what we can keep is pretty limited. And so there is this problem, but, you know, it, there are food like resources in the community, but they're only going to have limited things. And a lot of that's going to be that, you know, less healthy or more like um, carb heavy kind of stuff. Um, and that, you know, we're glad that there are some programs that do challenge that a little bit. So I think like SNAP, if you are able to get on SNAP, um, they do actually have some like coupons and stuff or like matching if you like take your um, card to farmer's markets. Um, but that definitely is still a limitation of a lot of the resources that we can offer. Thank you, Ree. So our next question is, are any of your organizations working on preventative work and growing food for when the Earth's surface temperature rises too high for crops, for crops to grow successfully? And I guess I'll just, um, you know, jump in briefly. I think, you know, part of our work is to try to localize the food system so there's more, more food grown locally and by more diverse small farmers so that we hope that as, um, you know, climate change gets worse that we can at least have a, a, a food system that's not coupled to this much larger, larger system. Um, I think if we're if we can create some models um, that work locally on a local level, and then how can we help people to learn how to regenerate some of the soils that have been degraded um, or are not in use? You know, as the as the the need for more and more local food rises, and we can have the opportunity actually to to fill that need. Um, you know, um, it is something that we're we're looking at. Um, yeah, I mean, if if the whole earth gets too hot to grow food, then then um, yeah, our little efforts aren't going to really uh, mean that much. But hopefully, you know, we'll be able to get ahead of of some of this. And then, you know, we're lucky in the Northwest to be somewhat of a of a, a climate 
um, refuge here. And so if we can create a, a sustainable local community um, resource. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a tough question. I'd also add that food systems contribute to some, I believe it's 21 to 37% of greenhouse gas emissions, um, according to the IPCC. Um, and just realizing that the way we are growing food right now is directly contributing to climate change. And so what we can do to grow food in a way that is actually um, making, contributing to regeneration of the soil. I hesitate to use the word regenerative because it has like certain connotations, but um, essentially that um, how we grow food now is determining our future. Um, and if we just jump to like high tech solutions, we're, we're kind of missing a step there. Thank you. Wonderful. So tying back into our last panel question, the next question is, have any of the panelists been inspired by something, an, something another panelist said about ways to expand or other steps to take um, in getting involved? I like what Noel said about um, joining organizations in the community can, can make more change than individuals, right? So that's a way to get involved. Um, yeah. To a similar point, I think everyone coming here together is showing that social change ecosystem, whether you're working in food security on campus or you're working on the farm, um, so many different levels are needed and it's not to say that one is better than the other because it's all part of the puzzle so. right, thank you so our next question is how does land ownership or the lack of such land ownership contribute to food justice and how did working the soil contribute to your sense of belonging Oh, I could jump in here. Um, wow, land ownership is such a complicated issue for me, um, right? Because nobody, none of us, we're all colonizers unless we're indigenous on this land in some way. So what does it mean to, to own land? I, that's a very complicated question. At the same time, we also live in a country where so many people um, have historically had their land stolen from them or been forcibly removed or, you know, everything from, uh, you see how much black land loss has happened in the past 100 years to Japanese internment taking away hundreds or probably thousands of farmers lands here in the Northwest and all along the West Coast. Um, so yeah, it's a very deep and complicated issue. Um, and then from my like a more current perspective in terms of farming, I'm, I personally lease land and most of the farmers I know also lease land because land is held often by large corporations. The Gates Foundation is like the second largest landowner in the country or something like that, along with Harvard. There's like really weird people own a lot of land because there's money in it. Um, and, you know, it's all often like white, landowners who pass on land to other to their white children um and and keep that wealth in in the hands of white folks that continues to be passed along so at the same time it's really hard to be to land and to not have the longevity of knowing that what you're putting into a place is a place that you'll be able to be for at least like five years um, so anyway, I think it's a very, it's a very complicated is issue and it's something that we could have a whole nother panel discussion on. And so I'm curious to hear other folks thoughts on 
how it would con can contribute to justice um, under the world we're living in now. And the sense of belonging, I think it's a very good question. I, for me personally, I, I, I guess I feel like I most myself when I'm outside and my hands are dirty. And so, um, and I feel very connected to the place and the ecosystem and being outside and working the land every day. Like you really notice when the swallows return and that means that spring is back and um, you just have a very, I don't know, I, I feel like I have a more, a more attuned to the cycles that the earth is going through um, by working the land. Thank you, Emma. So our next question is, how can food justice also be culturally relevant to BIPOC cuisine? How to navigate redistribution networks and food exchange? Um, you know, we're, we're, I'll, I'll tr try to take a stab at that, at least part of that question. I think, um, Right. We, we strive to to ask our communities, what is it that they would like to eat? Right. And that we that we can grow to support those communities. I think part of part of a real food justice is not just a certain amount of calories. Right. Uh, and and vitamins and minerals, um, uh, protein, carbohydrates, and fats. Right. But uh, but uh, it delivered in a whole food way that 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 folks can relate to. And we can't certainly grow a lot of the food that our um, folks are are used to, um, um, but we we can grow quite a bit. Or there's or there are some local varieties that grow pretty well. I mean, folks you know eat greens all over the world, and so it's important to try to figure out what greens might be might be worthwhile for those folks. Um, so I think I think it's we try to say yeah, um, what is it that we what, did, what is it that you'd like and, and how can we support you in growing that? Um, Alrighty, thank you so much. Um, with that, we're gonna move on to the wrapping up and the audience call to action. So now for the audience, maybe reflect on the questions that were asked so far and you know what are your takeaways from this experience and what are you thinking now of your role with food justice here's our main question what is one thing you would like to take away from this event Robert says, educating myself more about the issue and finding local programs to volunteer with. Very good. Sharing my resources to local organizations and communities. And another person said, one takeaway for me is thinking about how to do these things in community. I find it very difficult to contemplate taking next steps on my own, but in connection with others, I see more possibility. Very true, community is so powerful. 
And the person says, it's a starting place for me. I want to do a lot more research on local farms, volunteer opportunities, farming policy, and making more sustainable food choices. I'm also interested in researching native plants and food options that grow in the P&W. Awesome. Another person says, I love the idea of figuring out how your niche's talent is and the interest that can help this issue, even if it is not immediately evident how it connects to food justice. I want to do this. And Tammy says, I have gardened my whole life by turning the soil. I would like to implement no dig agriculture into my backyard. Amazing. Nora says, meeting active role models that already walk the walk through their daily actions and engagement. And Olivia says, holding myself accountable to the way my privilege impacts others' experiences with food sovereignty, justice, and security. All right. Carrie says, incorporating what I've learned into my current journey in understanding food justice and the huge inequities in our food systems. Very true. Michael says, I want to give my time to some local organizations in person when it's safe to do so. I will probably give money in the meantime. Good call. Joe says, I would love to make growing food more intentional and accessible for myself and my family. Also doing more research on how to increase local offerings of fresh produce to our campus community. Rachel says, reframing the myth that food is scarce, but rather the limitations are around distribution and access as Emma explained earlier. Very true. Wonderful reflections. I think we're all feeling so inspired to make real change with our decisions and our buying power and just, again, reframing the way that we look at food and food justice. All right, um, we seem to have slowed down in our reflections, so I think I'm going to just go in with some logistics right now um, for, a, for a wrap up. Thank you everyone so much for coming to this event. It's been incredible to have you all here. It's been incredible to have all of our panelists here. I, I feel inspired. I feel energized. This has been wonderful. Um, so just a few little wrap up logistic things. Uh, as we mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, this meeting will be has been recorded, um, as you know, and the recording will be available hopefully soon. We'll, we'll have to figure out the logistics of that, but that will be going up on the same web page where we put information about the event. I know someone is going to be posting some links in the chat. Um, and we also have a slide with a few more um, resources, um, which may come up or not. Um, so if you want to know any more about our panelists, their organizations, contact them further. Um, we do have some information about how to how to find out more about their organizations. There also I see some people I see Noelle has already posted something in the chat. So I would encourage our panelists to paste anything in the chat that they would like people to contact them by. Um, we also have this web page again. Oh, yeah, okay, the slides up now. So here are here are all of the all of the different places you can reach people. Um, we also have these links for the community reads spring programming, which is where the event recording will be posted. The recording will also be posted on our Canvas page for those in our community. So anyone with a UW Net ID, any member of UW or Cascadia, can access our Canvas course. And we'll be posting the event recording up there as well as the reflection question so that hopefully people can continue the conversation if they'd like to. If you want more from this topic or more from Community Reads, and again, are in our 
community, we encourage you to join us in Canvas. Uh, as Tammy mentioned, our reading is Black Gold by Leah Penniman. It is wonderful and we highly recommend it. We'd love to see you on the discussion boards if you can manage to this sometime this quarter. If not, that's also fine. And if you are interested in this content, but you're not in community reads, uh, or if you're not in our campus community, the information is also available on the website, uh, on our library website with uh, information about all of our readings and our discussion questions. So that can still be accessed. We also have a link to a food justice resource list if you're interested in learning more about any of these topics or interested in, in reading more or in finding out about other local organizations and local farms that you can support or learn more about. That's also in the food justice resource list. Um, and I, Okay, good. Michael has just pasted those links into the chat. So there's the Canvas course, the spring quarter page, the food justice resource list, and a link to our slides. So again, thank you all so much for coming. And thank you especially to all of our panelists and to our wonderful moderator, Juliana. This was an incredible event. And I am so thrilled to have just gotten to sit here and listen to everyone talk about all these things. I, again, I feel so inspired. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you to everyone for presenting. We'll just wrap up and I hope that everyone has an excellent day.